Now the kids are going to be dismissed, but would you be seated and uh, bow your heads and close your eyes for another moment? Sometimes in worship I stop singing and I just pray. I can't explain that. I just feel led to do that. I think we should do what we feel led to do. Prayer is definitely a great form or expression of worship. And as I was doing that, I was just thinking about the people that are here, what God wants to do in your life. Because it's a different point of view than all the other lives in here. So can I ask you, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, whether you know them or not, would you pray for the person next to you? If you got somebody on the left and somebody on the right, I'd pray for both of them. If you don't know their name, God does. If you're on the aisle, pray for your whole section. Just ask God to do a work. To speak to them. Intercede on their behalf. And when you're finished, ask Him to help you to receive what God wants you to receive today. God Almighty, I know that you have said through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we have free access to your throne of grace, not by our works or our holiness or our righteousness or anything that we have done, but because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us, we are allowed to come to you. I thank you for every person in here that has done that. And I pray for each and every person that didn't. That God, you just speak to all of us today. Because we need you. And so I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, you can open up to Luke chapter 15. And it's going to be a little bit before we get there. But uh, the main text, the main passage uh, that I want you to receive today is Luke chapter 15. And so all the other verses will be on the screen. Uh, for you to be able to read, and if you're just like a sword drill champion, you grew up in one of those environments where you had to hold your Bible up, and they said a verse, and you raced to the verse, if that is your special skill in life, then I challenge you to look up every verse in your Bible as I share. But only sword drill champions have a chance at that. If you don't know what a sword drill champion is, um, you didn't have a proper upbringing. I'm just going to throw that at you. You can do whatever you want with that shade, but that, that's not on me, that's on your, your parents. Um, this next sermon series is something I'm fired up about, and, and, and these types of series for me are the most important ones. When we talk about who we are as a church, what we're supposed to be as a church, when we look at Legacy's DNA, uh, we're looking at a body's DNA. We're not looking at a building or an organization. That's not what we are. Legacy isn't this space and, and, and all of this that's in here. Legacy is all the people that belong to a body, a family. And uh, there are purposes that God has for us corporately. And all of those purposes you'll find in Scripture line up with individual purposes that He has for your life. And so it's huge when we go through them. So this series, Let's Grow Together, is going to be tracing through uh, some of these. And the first one we always end up talking about is found people find people. And so like five people ain't been that and everyone else is like, oh no, he's going to tell me to witness and I don't talk to other people about things and stuff. I just don't do that. But look, there's a lot of ways to be a found person that finds people. And I think probably the angle we take today will be completely new. Maybe one you've never thought of, but it's straight out of Scripture. And if we as a body can grow together in these ideas and in these thoughts, um, we're going to be right on purpose. You know, we will be purposefully walking to a vague destination. Don't you want a cottywomple? I know you do. I know you do. You want the t-shirt and the back says, been there, done that. So um, the first thought I want you to get is this legacy is a church whose foundation is the five purposes God has laid out in his word. So God does not uh, always do things like in some mysterious way. There are works of God's that are mysterious. But often when it comes to God's will or what He wants you to do with your life or how to get saved or how to move forward in your relationship with Him, the things that God wants you to know, He has written down in a very obvious way in a very special book that, that I know you can buy anywhere. Like Walmart still sells it. You know what I'm saying? So if you read that book and you understand that book, it'll become very clear that when God designed and created this 
family, this, this organism, the church, and said, I want the church to be my vehicle that I reach the world with. When he did that, he had purposes for the church. So we've discovered what those purposes are, and we've lined our church up, and for more than a decade, decisions have been made time and time again for one of these five purposes. And it's a big deal to me that, that you make it here in the next uh, you know, series in the next five weeks or so because you're going to learn about all of those because the purposes that legacy is built on are also God's will for your life. Now there's specifics to how you carry it out, uh, but it is God's will for your life. So I also want to talk just about this, the, the point of decision, because I'm going to ask you to make decisions every single week. Right? I mean, are you excited not to come to church and to be entertained or to come to church and somebody talks over your head and you have no idea what he said, but he sure sounded smart, use words like Connie Womble, right? And no, I want you to know the plain and simple truth from Scripture and I want you to make decisions based on that truth that you hear so that when preaching is done, you're different. Because we should be growing. One of our purposes is growing people changed. You become different as you learn more and more of what God has built you for, why He made you, what your purpose is. And so in the process of that, it's got to be a heartfelt decision. See, the point of decision is so powerful if it is from the heart. We make decisions all the time that are not from the heart. You know how you can tell those? You didn't follow through. You didn't do it. You said you wanted to do it, there might even be a point, like a point of decision where you're like, I'm going to be this, I'm going to do that. It didn't happen. Heartfelt decisions don't go away like that. Heartfelt decisions need to have a higher level of importance in our life. The Bible says this in Proverbs 23, 7 a. Go. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Oh, there's so much application to this. I mean, there's so much you can say about this. As a man or a woman thinks in their heart, that's what they are. You want to be different? Think different in your heart. Make some heartfelt decisions to be different. If it doesn't come from inside of you, if there isn't a burden attached to it, you'll just keep being what you've always been. You know the old saying, people don't change? Right? Every generation has said that. Back in the 1800s, when people were like riding horses and didn't have cell phones and had no idea that Google was coming. Do you know that people back then didn't really change either? Because people don't change on their own. The Holy Spirit changes people. The Word of God changes people. Because the change has to happen in the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything you're doing in your life is because of what's going on inside of you. How you think and how you feel and how you interpret life is what's coming out. How powerful is it when that's led by the Holy Spirit who's leading you to follow the Word of God? The point of decision has to come from the heart. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 34b, all that means is the end of the verse instead of the beginning of the verse if you've never got that. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Ooh. I love this one. You want to know who you are? Look at the words you say. Look at what comes out of your mouth. That is what you are. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaketh. You know what's really good about this? Like if somebody says, well, I'm not a critical person, but let me criticize you. <laughs> right? It is really hard to tell that person you're a critical person. What are they going to do? Criticize you for calling them critical. Who are you to judge me? You hypocrite. You know, get the beam out of your own eye. I mean, honestly, they're going to be what they are. If you look at your mouth and you don't like what's coming out of your mouth, you have a heart problem. You don't have a circumstance problem. You don't have a I watch too much news problem. You don't have a I need my social media to be different problem. You have a heart problem. And see, I'm not judging any of you right now because I don't know what comes out of your mouth. I don't know if I care to know. Um, but I do know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And it is a good tool for holding a mirror up in front of ourselves and saying, where am I at? Are there some decisions that I need to make that are different? And here's the first one. And, and look, you've got to get this one because you won't, you won't be able to do the one that matters most if you can't do this one. So the first one is this. Decide the narrative is not 
about you. The story of your life is not about you. Isn't that great? When I hear that, I just, I think to myself, that's so true, but it's just, I'm the main character in my story. I'm the one making all the decisions. If I wrote an autobiography, it'd be my voice. And yet, Scripture clearly tells us that it's not about us. That God didn't make you for you. He made you for Him. Colossians 1.16 says this, For by Him, literally, specifically, it's talking about Jesus Christ. But we know that God is God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But it's literally talking about Jesus Christ. It says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. And then it concludes, she's got it all up there for you. And it concludes, all things were created by Him and for Him. Everything was made for Him. So that means you were made for Him, right? So the narrative of your story is not about you, it's about God. Like God actually loves and cares about you that much that He created you and He's allowing you to live in this time and in this world as it is with everything going around you. He's ordered your steps of who your parents are, how you grew up, where you were born, the language that you speak. All these things that are, that are about you are not actually about you. They are for Him. And when we make a shift in our lives or in our minds, when we make a, a heartfelt decision to say, you know what? I get it, God. My story is not about me. It's about you. Things change. And I promise you, you will never be able to embrace that found people find people if the story is about you. If the story is about you, then you, my friend, are still lost. I don't mean you're unsaved. I just mean in life, you're still lost. Your direction and your choices are all about what's best for you. How do I get the house I want? How do I get the car I want? How do I get the friends I want? How do I get my spouse to act the way I want? How do I get my kids to act the way they want? How do I get the right president and him to act the way that I want? Or her to act the way that I want? How, how do I create the world around me in my own image, the way I want it to be? We would never dare say that out loud in prayer to God, would we? By the way, God, I just asked if you would bless me as I create this world in my own image. Amen. Right? I mean, he doesn't strike people with lightning, but, but you'd be worried, wouldn't you? If there was a little crackle, all of a sudden you'd be like, oh, sorry, just kidding. Pastor told me to tell that. Don't say that. If the narrative is about you, then you'll interpret everything that's happening in your life that it's about you too. Everything God brings into your life, it can't possibly be so that you might be a found person finding other people. It's just God doesn't like me because I'm a sinner, so he brought bad in. Oh, God now likes me because I did some good things and God brought good in. Oh, it's the valley. Oh, it's the hilltop. Oh, it's the valley. Oh, it's the hilltop. And everything's about you. And that's all God's doing with the entire universe. So the narrative isn't about you, but you were created for him. So he cares immensely about your life. And everything he's doing in your life is on purpose. God doesn't cottywomble. There's never a vague destination for him. He knows exactly where he wants you to go. And so the narrative isn't about you, but every point of view in a story really, really matters to that story. It determines like the relativity of the story. Like whoever's point of view you're looking at, how, how does the truth relate? What's the expression of the truth? How does that truth like punch? How does this truth hit someone? Well, every person in here has a different point of view of the world that we're living in and the things God wants us to do, right? And to accomplish all that God wants to accomplish in the world, He wants to use all of those point of views. So the, the story of the prodigal son is very familiar, right? There's this dude, and his dad is rich, and he asks his dad for all his money, and this dude goes off to Vegas, spends all of his money, and then loses all of his money, and then he's real sad about wasting his inheritance of like millions and millions of dollars. So he goes and he works for a pig farmer, and he's feeding pigs, and he's like so hungry he would eat the food that he's feeding the pigs. So he decides to go back to God, in the story, that's who the father represents. The prodigal son goes back to his father, and his father comes running out and embraces him and doesn't embrace him as a servant, but he embraces him as a son. And the older brother doesn't like it, and he doesn't go into the party. There you go. Prodigal son story in 1.7 seconds. So, if you look at that story from the father's point of view, 
you glean some truth, don't you? How do you think the father experienced that story? If it would have happened, what about the son? The one that ran away? If you think about how he experienced it, doesn't it immediately change? It's a really different story. If you think about it from the older brother's point of view, the story changes again. Truth doesn't change. Truth is truth. But the point of view affects how that truth punches you, how it hits you. And so you have to understand that God doesn't want the narrative in your mind to be about you. But He definitely cares about your point of view and how you're experiencing this story that's supposed to be about Him. So you infinitely matter to God, but not because it's all about you. God will not make this decision for you. Like if you say, okay, today, pastor said, in order for me to live the Christian life, I have to decide that my story is not about me, it's about God. That the narrative isn't about me. God won't make that decision for you. Like the people serving God with their lives and people who are broken and sinful and nobody's perfect, but the ones that maybe you have around you and you're like, oh, I think that person's a good Christian. I think they're trying to pursue God. Those people, it's not God that made that decision for them. He didn't come into their house one day and say, hey, look, I'm going to lay your life out. Here's how it's going to be. God doesn't do that. What, what God does is that He gives you all of the ingredients so that you can make the decision for yourself. But you have to make the decision. Make no doubt about it that God will give you everything you need. In fact, He'll even lead a preacher to preach a message and get you to church on a certain Sunday so that you'll hear that message preached. He might have done that this week, this last month. There might be a reason that you are here today. And maybe that reason is because God is giving you all of the ingredients to begin to make heartfelt decisions that will get you on purpose with your life. But I just think it's powerful to recognize that He doesn't make that decision for you. Found people find people, and they cannot do that well if the story is about them. Because you won't be concerned about everyone that's around you. Can I tell you one of the greatest evils in this world? When a Christian talks bad about another Christian, about a church, about scripture or Bible verses or truths that are in there, when anything that is a part of what God owns is talked about negatively by someone who God owns, it is detrimental to his cause. And you will only do that if the narrative is about you. If the narrative is about other people, you will think in your mind, if I say this to my coworker, who I know isn't a Christian, and how Enid, how Enid, no one in here is named Enid, right? I found the name that no one is named, right? I hope so. If your name is Enid, I did not know that, okay? So if, if you go into your boss and you say, Enid, she parked in my parking spot, she took the last cup of coffee, and then she sat in my seat. She's a jerk. You're saying that because of how it affects you. Because the narrative and the story is about you. Have you ever thought about what that's going to do to the coworker or the boss you're talking to? What will they think of church? What about next week when you go to them with a card and you invite them to church and you tell them it's the most friendly place on earth? They're going to be like, no, no, you go there. It can't be the friendliest place on earth. Look, Look, life is about love. Life is about God. Life is about this gospel that He has created. Life is about found people finding people. It is one of our purposes. And if you don't grab this thought, you can't do the other ones. If the narrative is about you, then these other points are not going to be something you can grab. So I really like to be uh, sophisticated in the way I challenge you. And I know sometimes I use words that you might not get. They're just maybe above your head because you're lesser in intelligence than me. So I work very hard to make sure I use those kinds of words because I'm all about me. So here's number, somebody's going to watch just that clip on Facebook and they're, the thing's going to go off. I, that was total sarcasm. The church was laughing. Decision number two, decide to never, decide to never stop flapping. I looked it up. Flapping is doing this. <laughs> Ducks do it to fly. People do it and they just look weird like I just did. I really hope this sticks in your head. Look, the Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 31, 
It says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We like it when we're compared to eagles. We like it when that is summed up into our lives. Do you know how an eagle learns to fly? Its mother shoves it out of the nest. Think about this, okay? This is important. An eaglet, a little baby squawking eaglet, knows nothing but the nest. Comes out of that egg, as hard as that journey must be. And it's fed by its mom, vomiting into its mouth. No other way around it. God made it to be that way. Please don't feed your kid that way. You know? <laughs> Humans do not do that. It's not okay. So, so as a result, the eagle, the eagle takes care of its eaglet, and all it knows is... My home is the nest, my security, my shelter is my parents, my food, my being, my existence is my parents, and maybe I have some other little eaglets that I get to hang out with. And the day comes when mom steps down into the nest, not to feed you, but to shove you out of the nest that's been made on a cliff. And you had better stop, start flapping, right? Literally, if you ever watch this, the eaglets will just flap, 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 and they just, they get it. But it's got to be crushing, crushing to be shoved out of that nest. This is totally free. Some of you moms need to be eagles. Shove them out of the nest. You can do what you want with that. <laughs> Holy Spirit can interpret that how he wants. Look, here's the thing I want you to get. It needs the crushing. The eaglet needs the crushing. The, the pressure helps it find its purpose. And we need that crushing. But if the narrative is about you, when the crushing happens, you'll just be mad at God. Why are you letting this into my life? We say inside of ourselves, God, you have no right. This is my story, and I don't want that in my story. You've got some crushing, don't you? When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, so many believers don't understand that. They struggle. He's talking about his purpose. His purpose was the cross. He came to die. He came to die on the cross to be executed, not just crucified. Executed, not just by the Romans. The Jews called his name over Barabbas. Let's, let's have the murderer released to us. Let's have Jesus, the Son of God, die on the cross. His cross. What's yours? Because I don't know what your cross is. I don't know the thing that God's going to put in your life that is going to feel crushing. But what I know is you will not be alone in that thing. You will not be the only person that goes through that. Physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain, spiritual pain. All these pains that come into our lives, every single one of them has purpose and meaning and reason. Because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll be right with you through every crushing circumstance. When you get shoved out of the nest, I'll be the guy floating next to you as you flap as hard as you can so that you figure out how to soar. That's who God is. And we're in a world full of people that are getting crushed and they don't have it. Do you ever wonder what a person does when they lose a loved one and they don't know if there's a heaven or not? How do they cope? I'm not talking about they, they think the person maybe went to hell. That's a whole different thing. I mean the people that have no idea if there's an afterlife. My person that I loved is just now gone and evaporated into nothingness. I can't remember a time in my life that I believed that. Like even though I got saved as a teenager, I never had a time in my life where I thought that was the case. There are people in this world that are getting crushed the same way you're getting crushed. So you have to flap with all of your might so that you might fly and meet them and teach them how to do the same thing. God will use even the stuff you think disqualifies you. Like this, you know, this one is just, it's, it's heartbreaking for me to think about, but we all have something in our life that's kind of disqualifying, don't we? Like if we took your life and we put it up on the screen, would you be allowed to stay at church? Would you stay at church? That thing that you think disqualifies you, there are other people 
that have made those poor choices. There are other people that have stepped into it like you have. There are other people that feel like they're not enough and God can't possibly love them because they chose what they chose. And even in your weakness, God says, I am strong. He says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And the thing you might be trying to hide from the whole world might be the thing that lets you embrace this purpose that found people find people. They find them. I do not like the way my feet feel. When it rains, my pain just goes up. And it's going to rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Can we just praise God a little bit that it's not going to snow? Yeah. Because we didn't live in Dubuque or wherever it snowed. Like, I, I'm going to give him some praise for that holla up to heaven. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that is worthy of praise. But my pain connects me to people that I would not be connected to if I didn't have it. So I thank God for it. Now I'm not asking for Him to remove it. I thank God for all of you that are. If He does that one day, I'll come and hug you. And thank you that you kept praying that way. I just pray that He, he allows it to be low enough that I can function and do the things He wants me to do. Because He might want to use the thing that's crushing in order to reach someone else that's being crushed. I don't think we can have that perspective. I don't think we can think that way in life if the narrative is about you. If the narrative is about you, you just be mad that God did whatever He did. So if you're going to decide to never stop flapping, you first have to decide that the narrative is not about you. And then, if you'll make those decisions, you can make this last one. Decide that one more matters. Even if it's just one more. It matters. So Luke 15, our main text that we finally got into. Jesus says this in verse 4. What man of you, or woman, having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. <coughs> Jesus says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Heaven rejoices when one person is found. Can I tell you that God has said in His Word He's not willing that any should perish? His desire is that everyone would come to know Jesus as Savior. And that verse is coupled with this truth that that's why He hasn't come back yet. Because He's patient and long-suffering and not willing that even one would perish. <laughs> So if you make the decision, if you decide in your heart and your mind that, that the narrative is not about me and that I am going to keep flapping when I get crushed and shoved out of that nest, I'm going to keep flapping because one more person matters. If you had to go through something awful, I mean horrendous, but you knew it was the only way that your kid would come to know Christ as Savior, wouldn't you go through it? I mean, parents, can you just go there with me? If God showed up and said to you, the only way your kid escapes hell and goes to heaven forever is for you to go through this, and it's awful. When you go through it, and I'm glad I don't have to be crucified for that to happen, but I do that for my kids. Not even knowing all that it means. I don't care all that it means. I do that for my kids. I love them that much. So, so if God thinks of every person infinitely more in his love for them than the way we can love our kids, then doesn't one more matter? If you have to go through cancer to reach one person who wouldn't be reached if you didn't, isn't it worth it? If you have to not have all the things you wish you could have, and money and finances are going to be a constant struggle in your entire life, and you go through that because someone else that's going through that might be one to Christ by it. Wouldn't you go through it? 
If you have to remain single in your life, and you so want to be married, but the pain that you're going to feel, the loneliness you're going to go through, is going to allow one more person to get saved, wouldn't you go through it? I mean, wouldn't we? Or are we selfish enough that I'd say, I don't know that person. I don't know who they are. They're not family to me. So I'd like my life to be good and someone else. Someone else can reach them. You know, the beautiful thing is, is that God doesn't, he doesn't operate the way I'm illustrating it. He doesn't ask that of us. He just says, hey, live for me. Don't, don't complain about all the stuff in your life. Just flap really, really hard on your cottywomple. Can someone take a picture and put that somewhere for me? Pastor John. And then like you can say Sunday morning, flap really hard so you can cottywomp. That's going to go viral, you know? <laughs> but look, I am, I am dead serious. Don't allow the crushing to be interpreted that God doesn't like you and he wants you to go through your pain. You're going through your pain for a purpose and a reason. And it might be so that you can be a found person that finds people. So decide that, that the narrative is not about you. And you're never going to stop flapping. And that one more matters. One more matters. One more hand in the air saying you are holy. One more shattered heart singing to God you are good. Maybe one more voice crying out for mercy. Or one more hungry soul declaring, God, you're enough. It's worth it for one more. It's worth it. Look, I am not asking you in this next week, every single one of you, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, as a church, this week, you've got to go door to door and share the Romans road with as many people as you can. That's intimidating and scary and it's sometimes counterproductive for some of us. What I'm asking you to do is let people know you're a Christian. Let them know that you have joy about it. That you have security. That heaven is your home, not because you're good but because Jesus is. Let them know you go to a church, preaches the gospel, that tells it like it is from Scripture. Just let them know. God will take you from there. Well, I don't know all the answers. Great, neither do I. You don't have to know all the answers. You know how you're saved? We know that, don't we? We know the security and the peace it gives us. Found people finding people is not a mystery. It's not a complex thing. It is knowing the narrative is not about you. Keep flapping through all the stuff that's trying to crush you and recognize that even if all of that is just for one more, one more matters. One more is worth it. So I want you to stand to your feet if you would with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning.